My name is Ron Sofferman and I'm the CEO of uh, RSAP Vision. Uh, our company is a company that work uh, in uh, outsourcing. We do project to other companies. So uh, within uh, the 20 years that we work, we gain a lot of experience in managing project. And uh, today we work mainly in the US, uh, here in the West Coast. And uh, we carefully select a subject that uh, will interest you because uh, each one of us has some moments that uh, he feel that, uh, you know, uh, how it happens to me, what, what is wrong here? And we want to give some tools and some uh, insights into, into the different stages of uh, project management in computer vision. And most of the talk today will not be technical, it will be more on the aspects of managing the project in computer vision. So uh, let's start and uh, well, we have a very colorful chart here that show us that uh, there is a lot of uh, knowledge in uh, program uh, management and uh, there is a lot of uh, charts. Uh, but uh, my argument here that uh, uh, this is far from being enough to manage uh, the challenges uh, in our area. All these charts are looking uh, on the way to manage general software and uh, as soon as we get to computer vision we we think that it is essential that product manager will be expert also in computer vision and algorithms and know how each algorithms can be uh, can affect the way that the project is uh, done so one of the first uh, moves in uh, project management is um, uh, to give the requirements. So the requirements uh, is the basic of every project and here in the first stage we see that we deviate from other projects. Because if we have projects like uh, database or GUI, it is much easier to get very precise and very ordered um, definition of the way that it will work. But when we get to computer vision, the first question is uh, how do we measure the success and how we define the realistic input uh, for our problem. So uh, let's start with the measurement of success. So uh, you can ask for 99.9999 percentage or 98 or 90 or that it will work sometimes. But the true positive is only half of the true. The, uh, the true number has to be complicated and has to include other aspects, like what is the false positive rate, what is the false negative rate, what is the, the price of each of these uh, categories, and how we are going to measure it. Is it by uh, uh, this matrix of uh, of uh, true positive, false positive, uh, or by sensitivity and specificity. There are several uh, ways to measure it. And it is important to understand and define the success criteria early in, in the first design of the system. So let's uh, look at the automatic optical inspection. This is a very uh, known area where the the uh, requirements are very high because uh, every mistake will put the machine and all the device devices there to hold. So uh, they, they try to have definition with, uh, of course, the three sigma concept. And uh, for example, here we have some uh, defect mask that was uh, was uh, planned and designed to measure how minimal uh, we, we can go when we go to the defect size. So we can start with uh, uh, detecting bigger uh, defects and then to go smaller and smaller and even defects that are in size that is less than a pixel. But even here, uh, this is not enough because uh, uh, it depends where we see the defect. If the defect lies uh, maybe here along the, 
the straight lines, it's one story. But if it lies in the corner, maybe it's a nuisance and we don't have to care so much. So even in this case, there is not one number. You have to look at the different cases and define it. So as product manager, you don't have to stick to one number. It might be misleading. You have to see all the different cases and to relate to them. Um, for example, you can get very good results with 98% of success. If your target is, uh, for example, here to do OCR to architectural drawings, why do you want to do that? Uh, maybe uh, you want to have some estimation as a contractor and, uh, and know how, how much work do you have to do. What is the area of the walls that you have to paint? So you can read all these uh, drawings and automatically get this number. And 2% uh, is not something that will uh, affect you because anyhow it is some estimation. So we can see that even 98% may work quite well. And uh, it gets more complicated when we are talking about uh, the medical area. Uh, and uh, I'll give you some example. Here is a retina thickness uh, that is measured by OCT. It's optical coherence tomography. So it's, uh, it is very obvious how we measure the thickness in normal eye. So you can see it on the top. It's a piece of cake to understand it. But when you get to pathologies, there is some problem. Maybe, uh, and you, we can see it uh, very clearly, uh, in the left bottom example of the pathology, this cyst on the bottom, some of the experts will say it belongs to the retina, and some will say that this is uh, uh, subretinal uh, fluids, and uh, they will not agree. So we might find ourselves that even the ground truth that we are aiming to fit to will not be one solution. And in many cases, we found that uh, experts has different uh, scoring, and uh, we end up with giving three experts the same uh, task, and we are trying to be not less than the average one. So we, we take the, the average result with some uh, standard deviation, and we want to be in the, this area. So. Uh, uh, the ground truth is uh, not always an uh, easy thing to get. And in detection, uh, uh, in this uh, usual uh, task uh, that we already are familiar with, uh, when we have some box, uh, maybe the ground truth was, uh, was done in some specific way. And uh, if you want to measure the success, we can try to use uh, some measurement like an uh, intersection over union, but it doesn't always reflect the, the answer because if we found the person, this is enough for some application. So you don't have to get to very specific uh, definitions. Uh, and for the ImageNet, for example, uh, we are not looking only for the best result, but even if the correct result is one of the five uh, top uh, results, it's uh, enough for us. So uh, this is another measurement. Uh, we talk about the definition of success, but, but we have also to see that there's another dimension, the input images. Uh, <clears throat> we have to ask ourselves what is the variety of the images that we can get, uh, the quality of the images, and maybe the illumination condition, are they stable? Maybe the white balance uh, can differ. Uh, how much the input object of the image can differ from one another? And uh, in the medical area, which pathologies are we covering? Because uh, the pathologies are very often rare. So uh, we want to be sure that we cover all kind of pathologies and we have enough uh, examples that will train the system. So uh, one of uh, the, the good uh, ways to do it is uh, during the, the definition and also 
all during the development stages, we have to consult and show the results, even on a weekly basis or in a milestone basis, to the expert and to consult with him, because the knowledge expert for this area, which might be a technician or a surgeon or whatever is relevant, he is the one that knows uh, the details. And also, of course, the product manager is part of this, uh, of the a group of stakeholders. So we have to consult. Here is another example, coins detection. So maybe we want to detect it by uh, looking at the eagle, but uh, we can see in the left side that uh, there's a lot of scratches and it's very difficult to, uh, to read or even detect anything here. Uh, and pupil detection, that might seem very simple, uh, this is a very dark um, circle, and uh, we just have to find the center, so maybe we can do it even in sub-pixel accuracy. But when we get to more examples, we find that uh, narrow opening uh, is uh, very difficult to handle, Dark eyes cannot give us any chance to distinguish between the, the pupil and the iris. So we, we have to find another way. And by the way, this is exactly the reason why they use uh, infrared in most of the uh, gaze tracking systems. Uh, and reflections that might change the border, uh, so it might be very difficult to do the detection. Um, and uh, about image quality, <clears throat> you know, when we uh, develop the detection or some measurement in the system, and uh, suppose that the results are not so good, they will come to us, the algorithm fails. Uh, and uh, it's kind of blaming, and we start to look about uh, on the reason, and if we find that it's uh, the input low quality, and uh, this is the reason we must uh, <clears throat> understand and uh, get some tools to help us to eliminate and uh, to solve these uh, cases. So uh, <clears throat> what we <clears throat> offer here, and uh, here the red is uh, all the reflection that are more relevant to computer vision, uh, that uh, we have to prepare some unit tests that will run and uh, check the input images so that we can know that we are in a stable quality that uh, we train the system on. And uh, it will give us warning for the low quality images. So instead of uh, doing it only when we have problem, we can a priori measure the quality of the images. And there are several examples. We call it a acceptance test procedure or image quality test. So we can measure the noise. We can measure the sharpness um, by MTF or by measuring the derivatives. Sometimes we have some distortion in the system, so we can measure the number how much it, uh, it has the effect of pin cushion or barrel effect, aberration we can check, best focus, sometimes the focus is not the same in different areas of the image. And the color separation, which include the dynamic range and contrast, and is there any artifacts like vignetting, moiré, or there is no white balance. So the, the way to do it is just to to have the programmer write a specific code to test the input. And by that, we know that we promise uh, that the result will be much more stable. And one more option that is very important to take into consideration, that uh, in many cases, especially in the medical cases, it doesn't have to be fully automated. And we can get very good results when we use half manual and expert clues. Of course, uh, for industrial or semiconductor uh, application, it's, uh, uh, there's no way that it will work. But in medical application, uh, if we want uh, some input, or maybe in some cases, get some help from the 
a surgeon, it is very realistic because anyhow, uh, in many cases, they want us to, uh, to have the final approval of the results by the radiologist or by the, the surgeon. So if he's going to look at it, so maybe in some cases, maybe the 2% that we cannot solve automatically that are, has more complicated pathologies, we can add some uh, user interface that will solve this um, remainder. So to summarize this part, uh, the input images, we have to be very aware about understanding what is the different appearances of the object uh, and to do it with the field expert. And we have to quantify the quality of the images by doing some test, unit tests for the input. Uh, about the success criteria, we said that uh, we have to plan success criteria in the beginning, so all of the engineers will be aware of it. And also, I understand that it is not only one number. There are different cases and we have to relate to them. And if we can defer the commitment uh, to specific number until we have some proof of concept of some initial software, it will be much better because uh, then we can start to relate to the delta. Suppose that we said that uh, we are very optimistic, but still we don't have numbers. And after one month or two months, we start to get initial results and we say, okay, it's 90% now. And uh, the problem are one, two, three. And to solve it, it will take uh, this effort and uh, it will lead us to 95%. So it's much better way to, to work about it. Any questions? Any comments? Okay, so let's continue with the validation. And uh, what I want to, um, to show that uh, in many cases, the roadmap, of, the roadmap of the development is not independent. It really depends on the way that we can do validation uh, because Number, principle number one in development of uh, software is that we have to check and uh, validate each unit of software and algorithms. So if we want to validate, we need some data and we need some ground truth or some way to, uh, to know that we are doing the right uh, job. Uh, so uh, since this is the case and uh, we must have uh, data, uh, we have to understand uh, what is the, the phases that we are going to get the, this data. So, uh, for example, if we have uh, um, some project development or some uh, startup that works on uh, hardware and software with the product, and we have a very thoughtful Gantt that starts to to work on all the different aspects at the same time. So we have a parallel work and we develop the optics, the electronics, the system software, the GUI, everything we develop in parallel. But there's some catch. For us, for the image processing guys, we don't have any images at the beginning. All the images will be at the end. So what we are going to do? There's some catch here. So we, we have some options uh, and uh, these options that uh, we will show now is connected to the way that we created the roadmap because uh, we have option to get parallel data sources, maybe to simulate data. We can fix some artifacts of the first batch and uh, the way to do it is to divide the project into different parts and, uh, and in each part we will have some way to develop it and to test it as well. So let's uh, look at some example case study. Uh, in this case study we want to build O-Arm which is very much like a CT scanner but it can go into the operation room. So while the patient is lying on the bed, we can do a CT locally and 
uh, and see exactly where the different organs or the different uh, uh, vertebra or whatever we are uh, uh, doing the process to uh, is located now. And then we can use navigation system to do minimal invasive uh, process. So uh, <clears throat> uh, this is an example and we want to develop a new OAM. So uh, how do we build the validation program? Or we can phrase it differently. How do we build the roadmap around the validation uh, program? Which means, first of all, we have to break the process into units and to locate inputs even in the intermediate uh, steps. So we'll have input for every step and step and to develop uh, <clears throat> each step um, if it's possible in parallel in the whole uh, Gantt, but when we have different phases of input, it comes one after the other. And as soon as we, can, we have more real data, we can retest the system and uh, evaluate the results. And then we can solve the gaps between what is the real images and what we have in the intermediate uh, stages. So, in the case of uh, developing this uh, OAM, we can start with <clears throat> using CT, regular CT that uh, we have in the hospitals, and then we, we can use it and write our uh, software. Maybe the software is about uh, segmentation of the vertebra, maybe it's about uh, location of uh, some uh, places to do biopsy. So, we start with city, which is high end of uh, the scanning. And we can, in this case, we can start and do validation. Internal QA team can check it and we can, uh, we can do comparison to ground crews of uh, a physician or radiologist. Then we go to the next step. The next step, we will, we will search for some similar system. Uh, O-arm is actually some X-ray camera that move around the patient and have all the different uh, angles and then we can reconstruct the, the uh, like in, in uh, CT, we can uh, do tomography. So we can take a other system, it calls a Conbeam CT, and uh, use them as an input to the system. So we are getting one step ahead in, in uh, going to data that will reflect the final result that we want to get. So we can validate and, uh, and the data and do the testing. And then the next stage, we, we have the initial images from the system, but usually the initial system has a lot of uh, artifacts. So in that case, we would do some effort to solve these artifacts very uh, very temporarily in some software that we'll write, maybe we'll move some uh, of the artifact lines or some different uh, spots that we have to get the chance to do the measurement on data that is uh, from the real system. And then again, we can do the validation for that step. And at the end, we have the final images and we are at the final input and then we just have to tweak and do the validation again. So uh, to summarize this, uh, <clears throat> this part, uh, if we want to validate the software, we have to, to write a specific roadmap that will enable us to do it in, a, in each step and step. So it's very important that we will be aware that uh, this is part of the game. We don't just uh, try to develop everything uh, in a row. And find parallels or some, some chance we have in, uh, in some cases to do simulation that will be close to the images. And, uh, and then we fix the bugs and, um, uh, and uh, go to the next stage. Now the next topic that I want to talk about is uh, how different algorithm techniques can change the project manager's approach. Uh, and uh, we can see here on the left side a list of families of algorithms. Uh, families of algorithms that uh, 
are very different from one another. The deterministic, adaptive, statistical algorithmic uh, approaches, and of course, deep learning and machine learning and tracking. <clears throat> we are not going to teach here all these algorithms, but to show what is the concerns of the product pro project manager that uh, he would be he has to be aware in each of these approaches how much data he needs does this uh, kind of algorithm has any problem in convergence uh, how to validate this algorithm the changes of, of the algorithm are they easy or very difficult and how to maintain it for the long run uh, so i want to introduce you to some concept which is called algorithmic approach to validation <clears throat> Generally, in validation, we have some set of images and we are trying to test whether the software is working or not, what is the success rate, and this is called validation. But this is very partial because uh, in computer vision, actually the algorithms are the building blocks of the software. And each algorithm has its own assumptions, its own methods, and with that comes strengths and weaknesses. So if you want to validate the software, we must validate each stage algorithmically, which means that we are not waiting for some strange input to come. A priori, we are trying to estimate how the system will work with different kind of uh, inputs. Uh, we want to be, want, don't want to be doomed to test only what we met by chance, uh, especially uh, sometimes we don't have enough data in the beginning. So in the algorithmic approach, we start with uh, the algor algorithmic design document, uh, ADD, which is uh, something that is very known in, for FDA requirement. And in this uh, a uh, document, uh, all the details of the algorithms are uh, written there, the different stages and all the parameters. And the R&D manager will use it to communicate and follow up the progress. So instead of just uh, asking your uh, team, uh, how is the progress, what is the result, uh, it's good, very good, very nice, let's meet next week. You have to, to take this document, read it before the meeting, and try to see what exactly has been done in terms of the algorithm uh, side. And to co communicate data, test the assumption, and predict a variation along the product uh, life cycle, along the changing of the data, and uh, you can verify each la layer separately. Um, how it is done, and here again, red is the aspects of the computer vision. You do peer review uh, with the algorithmic uh, experts. Uh, so you assess in each case the weaknesses, assumption, and possible errors, and you're playing the devil advocate. And you test whether it's, this algorithm will cover all the cases and what, what uh, we can expect from the uh, data. Because sometimes we, we have to consult with the knowledge expert to say, does our assumption here will be valid for all the data, or is it something that uh, we have to uh, to change in our uh, system. And uh, about the, the parameters, sometimes we have many parameters in the systems. And this is a kind of a risky area because we can, we can write all the parameters, all the thresholds to some uh, XML file and to feel, well, we can change everything. But the truth is that uh, the user and even the, uh, the expert cannot change all the parameters and understand and they get to, uh, to the best solution with uh, changing the parameters. So the number of parameters that we, we can have as, a, as something for the user to change has to be controlled very much and must be very minimal. Um, so let's, let's look at the different uh, 
types of algorithms. Uh, for the deterministic algorithms, when we have some, uh, some background of physics, physiology, chemistry, or whatever that can give us real data, we are in a good shape. Because, for example, thermal imaging, we know that it measures the temperature. So if we expect to detect people because the temperature of the, the person is uh, different from the background, we know exactly what to expect. Uh, in city, we have some threshold. It's minus 200 uh, household unit between the air and the body. So it's very easy to write such uh, algorithms. Uh, and uh, also with the iodine, which is contrast agent that uh, is uh, injected into the blood, we can see uh, the arteries uh, as uh, very dark. And uh, we talk about the pupil as well. Uh, but here again, we have to go back and consult. Does this the, uh, do the assumption hold in all the cases? For example, background temperature, will it change uh, if we have different uh, situation? So in the night, it's very easy. But uh, maybe in the desert, in the uh, at noon time, there will, there will be different uh, contrasts and we will not be able to use it. Uh, with, in city, it really depends on the system. We mentioned that the uh, city is high level, but the uh, Conbeam city has some artifacts. And uh, sometimes we have around the face some artifacts that looks like uh, some tissue, but it's only artifacts. So everything has to be... Uh, um, consider uh, in terms of uh, validation of the assumption for the specific algorithm. Then the next level is adaptive algorithms that uh, <clears throat> doesn't have a fixed threshold. They take the threshold from, um, from the image itself. So we have dynamic histogram uh, and local statistics. Even JPEG is actually JPEG is uh, adaptive DCT. So the bit allocation changes according to the image. If we have some part that has more information, uh, more uh, energy, there will be more, more, we will locate more bits for this part. And for the other part, we will locate less bits if uh, the background is flat. So adaptive algorithms are very strong, but you have to, here again, you have to check uh, your assumption because sometimes you have some adaptive and it works very well, but in the boundary condition, maybe there's too much information and then you can see some blocking effect in the image when you do the, uh, uh, when you do the compression. So uh, this is example of, uh, uh, of adaptive. Then heuristic algorithms is uh, algorithms that you use some logics. Uh, for example, you know something about uh, the environment. You know that you're looking for specific size of uh, things. You compare th uh, things according to the place in the image related to other things. So you use some logics, some heuristics. It's very easy to understand it, so it's clear, so you can explain it and uh, you can get specific information. But you have to keep it balanced because uh, if you use too much of these uh, heuristics, too much of these logics, maybe the code comes to be very complicated and you change in some place, then the, you find errors in another. So it's like blanket, small blanket that you move from one side to another. Um, uh, with statistical algorithm, algorithms uh, like uh, mixed Gaussian or clustering, half transform uh, with geometric hashing, segmentation and edge detection, uh, these statistical algorithms are very strong. There is one thing that I want to emphasize for the product managers, that if you can convince the developer to change it into probability, you are in a much better condition. Because probability is some number that has meaning. So if 
if you detect something and you know that the probability to get it by chance is one per million, so you have some meaning. But if you just compare uh, numbers and you say, okay, I found it, I, I see here some threshold for the edges, it is something that you cannot uh, rely very, uh, very much on that. So uh, try to change it to probability. And uh, by the way, there is uh, some area which is called non-parametric statistics that uh, might help in uh, complicated cases where you don't have uh, Gaussian statistics and you need some other tools. Um, <clears throat> about optimization algorithms, uh, usually the, one of the strongest options that you can uh, have uh, in algorithms because uh, the, during the iteration you get to some result which is uh, um, optimized in some uh, sense. And uh, there is uh, very nice algorithms like a graph cut for segmentation, active contours, what it's called, snakes, level set, mean shift, diastra, Bellman Ford, very strong tools. Um, and uh, one of the problem is that um, although the result is uh, minimum or, or uh, optimum in some sense, you don't always have the, um, the way to check if it is the true results or not, because uh, this is something that looks uh, maybe the edges are the optimal, but uh, there is some something else that uh, happens there, and uh, you have uh, uh, you have some deviation from the ground rules. So, if you can uh, develop some external score, that suppose that you were looking for for the pupil, and uh, you found the pupil in some uh, algorithms, and then you you test how much. Uh, support you have, how many pixels support the location of this uh, pupil. So if you find that there are many, uh, many pixels that are all uh, shows and uh, the, that are all lie on the contour of the pupil, you are in a better way to give a, a score for this result. Uh, let's talk about deep learning. Deep learning is a big world. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> algorithm, algorithms there. And sometimes it's like black box and, um, and it's very difficult to manage it because um, you don't have an insight into the scientific part uh, of it like in other methodologies. So again, independent external score, you found something if you can then verify it by another test, it will give you much more support. Um, while other machine learning algorithms can be more, uh, uh, more easy to understand because uh, you can take some uh, features and the features are uh, maybe are justified by uh, experts from this uh, uh, area. And then you can do this, the, the classification by support vector machine over those uh, features. So you feel much more comfortable with uh, using such technologies. Although nobody can deny that uh, deep learning is uh, uh, much uh, stronger. Um, and the last uh, family of algorithms uh, is the tracking algorithms. Tracking is uh, when you have some uh, object that you detect in the first uh, uh, image and then you know, on the video we will choose some region of interest and the next stage you will uh, look for it only in this region of interest. The weakness of course is uh, how you recover when you lose the target uh, due to some variation, some sudden changes or whatever. Uh, the, of course, the cure is uh, to, to use some confidence level and to check for consistency in the appearance. If you find the object in one frame, 
uh, you can use the statistics of the same appearance for giving the score for the next uh, appearance. And you can re redo the target detection from the beginning. So uh, in that case, as a pro project manager, try to find all the different scenarios that can be because uh, uh, the tracking, though it's a very strong uh, algorithm, it has its uh, weaknesses of losing, uh, in different scenarios, losing uh, the target at all. Uh, so to, to summarize it, uh, when we want to validate uh, the software, we must validate each step uh, algorithmically, not enough to look at the final results. Uh, we use the ADD as the blueprint of the system, peer review with domain knowledge to try to think about different uh, cases, and again, different algorithms call for different uh, validation methods and uh, different ways that uh, uh, you uh, you consult your team how to uh, to make the algorithm more robust. Any questions or comments? Okay, maybe in the in at the end. So let's uh, look about uh, the. Um, oh, sorry. How to manage the progress in the uh, <clears throat> uh, in the project? So uh, we start the project, and uh, we want to have some scheme that will enable us to follow the progress. So in the left side, you can see very common uh, platform. It's very much like uh, agile. Uh, platform or whatever you you do, that you actually want that uh, uh, in every week or in every cycle, you have some results to present, whether it's uh, initial results, working software, some validation or efficiency test, you have to show some results. But here we will not stay with the general recommendation from software development. We will try to find what is different. And here, I'll give you 10 tips for computer vision project manager. So, uh, the first one is to review 100 images. So, in, uh, regularly, when we have a presentation of results, so we show three good results and two bad results. And we say, this is the gap. We think that this is not enough. Uh, if you want to get to really understanding of uh, what are the gaps and to really contribute and uh, maybe to see if there is a need to other uh, ways to develop it, you have to do, to do very diligent work and go over much more examples, 100. And, uh, and it will keep you uh, aware of all the different sides of uh, this algorithm. And sometimes even uh, the developer is caught by the number of the success. Well, we are in 90%, uh, now it's 91%. But look at the results. After 100 images, you will be much more knowledgeable about the weaknesses, where it falls, where it uh, succeeds. And, uh, and if you have uh, two sets of uh, success and fail, failures, so look at uh, both uh, sides and enough images from each side. Tip number two, uh, teamwork. So it's very trivial to say teamwork uh, in every work, but uh, actually in computer vision it has some uh, other flavor to it because uh, in many of the teams we have different uh, education to the different uh, engineers. Some come from mathematics, some from physics, some from signal processing. And it's very important that uh, they all be aware of what is happening and uh, what is done in uh, all over the development 
of the team. Because uh, there are some ideas that are very easy in one methodology and some other that are easy in other methodologies. So when we talk about uh, teamwork, uh, the reason is to get uh, new and fresh ideas from different uh, sizes. Um, and you can require teamwork, which means that uh, you don't only ask for everyone to say where he is, but really to describe it and to, to get feedbacks from other people during the meeting. Tip number three, about MATLAB and C++. <clears throat> Usually in the uh, in development of software, Sometimes you start with MATLAB and then you say, okay, when it works well, you go to C++. Nowadays, there is some problem around it that uh, if you develop in one environment, uh, it is not always easy to move to the other environment. It might get you into some uh, very hectic period because uh, you have some specific algorithms like uh, maybe edge detection, maybe you're using RANSAC, you're using uh, whatever half transform, and in every package it's different. So you end, you end up after you you create a very uh, a very stable software. Now you're starting to make changes, and uh, each algorithms give different results, and it becomes unstable. So uh, our advice here is to try to move as soon as possible to the uh, package that will be the final. And now it's not, uh, nowadays it's not so complicated. Even MATLAB has uh, some way to directly use uh, uh, OpenCV or, um, or use uh, some uh, interfaces into C uh, C++, so in that way you can be in a situation where you make the software stable and it will stay stable, only the outer software can be very clearly uh, migrate to the other uh, environment. Of course, if you're using Python, uh, you are uh, uh, in better position in that sense. Tip number four. Uh, deep learning is can be done in different ways. So <clears throat> naturally when we start to learn about deep learning, about this magic, we say okay we can do classification. You show this uh, image uh, to the system, you show to train it with the true and false and uh, it will work. But in reality, it's much more complicated, and uh, maybe it will not work at first stage. So you have to look for other way to make it work. And one of the way is to do it stage by stage, or brick over brick. So, for example, if you can detect something in the image that is stable for you, and relate it to the next stage, you can use the deep learning in a much better way. So if it doesn't work as a whole image, maybe you can find, okay, I can find the, the, um, the side of the object. And then on the side you can use to, to find the differences between the inside of the specific object. So to build it step by step and not always to try to go to uh, to solve the all classification at one uh, step if it doesn't work. Um, the next tip is about POC, proof of concept. So suppose that uh, you people ask you or uh, you have some requirement from the product manager to develop specific software. So if during the proof of concept you can use some given code if there is some code in the internet or in some uh, uh, research laboratories that you can use to make the first stages, it will help you very much to get to understand the more complicated cases. And then you can scope the work, which means that maybe there is some algorithms that do 
uh, 90%, which is not enough, 90% uh, of the work, but now you can see exactly what are the 10% and it helps you to scope the work that uh, is still has to be done. Um, <clears throat> tip number six, when deep learning fails. You are very enthusiastic, the team said, well, I can do it with deep learning, now it fails, what are you going to do? So, <clears throat> first of all, uh, my advice is not to rush to the stronger tools necessarily. People will say, okay, it doesn't work, but we don't have enough data. Uh, 10,000 is not enough, maybe we need uh, 100,000 of uh, examples. Maybe we need much more complex algorithms, more layers. Uh, maybe we just read uh, some new article and uh, we have some new ideas that uh, maybe this will be our uh, way to get out of it. First of all, try the regular methods of to look at, uh, and to solve such situation. First of all, you say you have to check the code validity because it's not just uh, using uh, you know this magic. You have to see that all the software work well, the training sets are well, that everything goes well. So don't accelerate the tools too easily, but see that you are in a good position. Maybe you can start to see where it does work, maybe in simple cases, and then you can continue from there. So don't be panic and don't be very stereotype about uh, uh, deep learning and say, okay, we just have to have more cases and uh, more uh, computational power. Tip number seven, uh, when specification change, sometimes the algorithm uh, part has to change. Sometimes during the project, you have some new specification. Now, the physician said that uh, he will not wait five seconds for your results. He will wait only two seconds. So the product manager come to you and say, comes to you and say, now the requirement is two seconds. Uh, so you have to find the limiting stage and try to replace the algorithm. And uh, you don't have to start from the beginning, but you have to find a way. And sometimes the way is that uh, uh, to use some cascading algorithm, which means that you use some simple algorithm at first uh, uh, stage, and it will solve most of the cases, and then it will be very fast. And in some other cases, you, you have to use more elaborated uh, algorithms and only on those cases it will take more time. So, but we be prepared that uh, things may change in the specs and in the algorithmic part. Tip number eight, the effort and the data set size. Uh, sometimes you start the project and all you have is maybe 10 examples and uh, then the hardware engineer tells you that these examples are bad and uh, we are going to have much better images in the, in the future. So remember that uh, you have to limit the effort if you have a few examples, otherwise you may do overfitting. So if you have 90% uh, success and you want to get more and you only have 20 images and you are uh, trying to fight for two images, this is not the way to, uh, to have robust software. So you may use the, this time to do other things in the system, maybe uh, uh, some other tasks that uh, may be important for the next stages. So if you have very limited data examples, don't invest too much in the algorithmic level, only what is needed. Tip number nine, running behind schedule. This is very often uh, happening. Uh, so you have to check what is the reason and to choose the way. So first of all, you have to look if there are some lack of uh, ideas or of uh, research uh, abilities in the group. And if yes, 
you can try to help with some other people uh, from the team or some other people in the company. Programming skills. Sometimes people can uh, invent uh, the, the brightest algorithms, but when it comes to writing C++, it will take them forever. So you have to look at uh, this and uh, do the estimation accordingly. And there are some uh, places where it's very difficult to see uh, why it doesn't converge. So you have to see, maybe this engineer is always trying new ideas and doesn't uh, go to solve one after the other. So maybe only the convergence part is uh, lacking. So you may do some reduction of the spec and deliver more minimal system uh, in the beginning. Uh, maybe you have to separate the research from the development and to dedicate specific people to do the research and other to do the development. <coughs> the algorithmic design document, again, this is the, one of the most important tools for communication, all the details of the algorithms, so you have to keep it concise, not uh, you know, 100 pages uh, long, uh, and uh, keep it relevant, so in each meeting you can see what we are doing now and keep it updated. So those are the tips and one, uh, one more subject that I will touch briefly is about uh, the team. So when you build a team in every software team you want uh, scientific skills, image processing knowledge, practical ability to implement algorithms and programming skills. And of course, motivation and human relation. Let's see what happens here in, uh, uh, in, uh, in our field. There is some threat that uh, I want to mention and uh, I have some title for, uh, for uh, an article that uh, I uh, wrote to the Computer Vision News. This is uh, the magazine that we have for uh, the algorithmic community. Uh, and uh, it calls uh, the unbearable lightness of superficial algorithmic development. <laughs> and what it says that uh, nowadays, when the tools are very easily uh, at hand, it is very easy to get examples and software uh, tools, and uh, it is very easy for efficient software engineers to try it. So maybe there is some software engineers that wants to try to do some uh, deep learning. So he read in the book and uh, how to do it, or actually he takes some example from the, from the internet. He doesn't even care for taking the course. And, uh, and he's uh, implementing some deep learning uh, algorithm. So it will give a very short and deceiving advantage because at the end, most of the problems call for deeper understanding and changes in the tool. And for that, you must have much more deeper understanding of the technology because it's, uh, in many cases, it's very difficult to understand what and how, uh, how this person really understand and to what level he understand uh, the algorithm. And uh, this example, uh, when we interview uh, new candidates, they say, okay, we learn uh, image processing, and we ask them to describe in details algorithms that you remember. Uh, and uh, he said, well, I know half transform. So you ask him about this specific algorithm, and then you can be sure that he really understand it. And uh, he said, okay, we can do uh, edge detection. What is Kenny edge detector? What is different from this algorithm to other algorithms? It's very important to get into communication of the understanding of the algorithms, not only to say that he is able to do everything with the black boxes, because uh, it is very short-sighted. Um, um, if we are talking about uh, 
other algorithms like uh, optimization, you can ask how this algorithm is working and uh, what is uh, strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes you have the luck to have uh, the dream team. Everyone in your team is uh, well educated, self-motivated, cooperative, and they want uh, to do the work. So what is left to do? So I'll give you uh, some uh, examples of things that, uh, that you have to take care of. First of all, to validate that each member have enough uh, advanced tools and knowledge. And uh, saying that I know to do deep learning is not enough. He has to be able to do the reasoning uh, behind it. And also to know what other team member uh, can do and can help with. And to encourage uh, <clears throat> popular and practical packages, because this is the way to maintain software. If you're using some, diff some very unique uh, environment, uh, the next engineer that will look at this code will have uh, problems to get into it and to maintain it. Uh, you have to communicate about the background and the goals of the project. So it's not enough, you have to keep all the, the, the team all the time will know what happens in the project uh, as a whole and what is the roadmap of the different sides, uh, uh, stakeholders, because there is a roadmap of the product manager, there is roadmap of the data collection, there is roadmap of the compliance to FDA. And you have to know all of this because they will need your results in the specific times when uh, they need it. And you have to prioritize the risk mitigation activities. So it's not only to write code, but to start with things that, uh, that are more uh, risky. And to build teamwork, to encourage co-working and sharing ideas, it is very important. Uh, you have to break the habit of uh, working as an individual that I'm responsible for this and I will do it and you can count it on me. This is very nice, this is important, but you have to be part of a team and to share ideas and to help other team members. And to remember, not all the algorithm engineers are created equal. Some have different uh, uh, tendency, so you have to choose the right one to each task. Some are more strong with, uh, with concrete uh, heuristics and some are more powerful in mathematics and statistics and uh, it can help you to, to get the right results. So, <clears throat> to summarize uh, our talk tonight, we talk about uh, different sides of uh, different aspects that the project manager has to take into account when it comes to computer vision. So first of all, success. Uh, there is different uh, ways to define success and you have to take into account from the beginning. And the validation process during the different phases when you don't have enough uh, real data in the inter intermediate, uh, inter in the um, different phases when uh, they only start to produce the hardware. And the different algorithms very likely will call for different uh, uh, project manager aspects of uh, managing the, the team. And about tracking the project, uh, you have to keep an eye about what is happening, incremental project managing uh, techniques that are common, but there are some tips that we were talking about that are uh, special for computer vision, and uh, we talk about how to lead uh, good and bad uh, teams. So thank you, and I want to mention that um, um, there are a lot of to say about uh, project management, and uh, uh, we have in the computer vision news uh, magazine, we have uh, much more, so uh, you are invited to look at it and uh, to read it. So thank you very much, and uh, if you have any questions or uh, 
Anyhow, we will be happy to get feedbacks on the meetup.